Uh, Father, I just thank you, God, for this time. Thank you for this service, this time of worship that we were able to share together, the, um, the words that came forth, Father, to bless us and just to testify of your presence in our midst. And God, I just, uh, I come to you again and, and lift up a petition to you in regards. I want to keep Scott and Suzanne in our hearts and minds, God. But also we want to keep before your throne the, the various people dealing with cancer uh, at various stages and various ways, be it Gail or Danita or Doug or um, Rose or Elaine, God. Father, anyone and everyone who we know who's struggling with these physical ailments, God, I pray that, Father, you would let your blessing pour out upon them, that your healing virtue would flow forth from your throne into their lives and into their bodies, God, and that you would set things right by the power and authority of your name. God, all you have to do is speak the word, and it's so. So, God, that's what we desire of you but we also submit and say, do what you will. And Father, I just uh, also want to lift up the Burkholder family, God, in their time of loss and tragedy, God. I pray that, Father, you would help them to find comfort in you, God. God, when they ask questions, that, Father, you would answer. We try to. We try to make sense of things, but, God, you're the one with all the answers. And Father, we thank you for new life, God. A new great-grandchild, grandchild, niece. Father, I just thank you for that. Thank you that everything went well and God, that they're, they're home now. I pray that you would bless this, this time in their lives and that they would cherish every moment. Just thank you, God. And Father, for the Time now as we get into the word, Father, I pray that you would bring to remembrance everything that uh, that you dropped in my heart and mind earlier this week, and that, Father, if there's things that ought to drop out of, off the pages, that they would just be skipped over. God, we give this time to you, and God, we ask that you would open open our ears, God. We often pray, open the eyes of our heart, right? We We, we ask for us to have... Open eyes, God, but open the ears of our heart, God, that we could hear your voice this morning. That we, you, we could hear you speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, interestingly enough, as we've been digging into this subject of God the Holy Spirit, there's come up in conversation a number of times one aspect about how he, God the Holy Spirit, interacts with us. And, you know, we're kind of moving on from how he produces in us that change of heart and the transfer, transformation of mind and our thinking and going beyond how he works in and alongside us to produce fruit of godly character. There is a realm of relationship with God that can be, and unfortunately in some circles, is blatantly overlooked. In that realm, we find this aspect of interaction. Quite simply, his voice. His voice. This aspect of relationship is one that was totally foreign to me most of my life prior to 2003 when the Lord got a hold of my heart. And even growing up in a Christian setting where I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, probably another night of the week. I don't even remember how many times a week I was in church. And I went to a, a private Christian school that, I mean, drilled the word of God into my heart and into my head. I'm thankful for that. I, that goes without saying, I'm thankful for that. You know, it, but even in that, I knew that God spoke and that he had a voice. I mean, clearly the Bible cover to cover talks about God speaking. What's it? It starts off with, and he spoke it into existence, right? And it talks about how throughout he's been speaking to man and interacting with man in various ways. And 
and speaking through man. But at the same time, that was in the Bible, right? I mean, God speaking, that was just in the Bible or, you know, that was just in the canon of Scripture that was deemed finished in the late 300s. But then God stopped speaking. Well, that's so, or so I was, I was taught and for a while, so I thought. You know, this concept of almighty God speaking to me was incredibly exciting when I came back to the Lord and he got his hold of my heart. Wait, God actually speaks. He's actually real. It's more than just words on a page. <laughs> it's amazing. Exciting. It wasn't without its struggles, though. I got to tell you, sometimes old ways of thinking die hard. Anybody experienced that? <sighs> New ways of living, they grow slow over long periods of time. But I got to tell you, the one thing that turned my world upside down was hearing his voice. Hearing his voice. From that point on, there was no going back. I was wrecked. I think, you know, I, one reason why I love when this topic comes up in conversation is that God being God and knowing each one of us better than we know ourselves kind of leaves a whole lot of room for how each one of us hears him. He speaks to each one of us differently, doesn't he? And perhaps even, you know, he speaks to us differently at different times in our lives. The way that he speaks to us now is different than the way he spoke to us 10 years ago. Or we're in, in this situation where we might expect him to speak this way, but now he speaks that way. Because he knows just what we need and when we need it. But just to explore this a little bit further among ourselves, I'm going to ask kind of one question in two different senses. In a general sense, what are the ways that God speaks? But also, how does he speak to you? Anybody want to chime anything in there? All right, Zeke. The way that I best understand it is imagine if you could communicate with someone without speaking, where basically meaning is conveyed from spirit, and, spirit to spirit. Yeah, yeah, so it's like there's, it feels like sometimes when you can't understand, but some part of me is retaining it. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's, I don't know, to me that's interesting where it's like, not necessarily like I hear a voice, but it's like, right. It's you perceive it. And, and yeah. for that reason, I can understand. That's cool. Yeah. Anybody, Wanda? Or... Okay. Hmm. Bull thistles. Yeah. yeah. I know those. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It seems beautiful. Wow, yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. It's rare. Okay, bring that. <laughs> <laughs> Give me more. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's rare, but um, Eileen and then John. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of spiritual download. <laughs> mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. John. Yeah. So so some sometimes it's he gives us kind of a direct like boom, you know exactly what he's talking about, but at the same time he sometimes he speaks in pictures and mysteries. Right? They, Just what you needed to hear, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. There, uh, there's one that just kind of came to me because you, you went with the movie direction, how God can speak to us through movies or lines in movies. It, he, absolutely. Um, he can even speak to us through secular songs. Before I came back to the Lord, I'm working at Silicon Plastics, 12-hour overnights, five days a week. There was a lot of mornings where I was miserable. I was depressed. I did not want to be living. And I was on my way home. And uh, I just was, I was not having great thoughts. We'll just pretty much leave it at that. And uh, this song comes on the radio by <sighs> Evanescence, Wake Me Up Inside. And that song went straight to my heart and it turned into a prayer. And within a week, God got a hold of me. <laughs> Through a secular song. 
Imagine that. Isn't that incredible. God created music too. That's right. He, and everybody who writes them. Yeah, so it's, he speaks to us in so many different ways. You know, we talked about the inner voice or that inner witness, how his spirit testifies with our spirit. That's right out of Romans. And um, sometimes that comes in the form of a check in the spirit, right? Have you ever got a check in the spirit where you're like, something ain't right here. We're not doing this. We're not going there. That's, this isn't right. Or sometimes the audible, you know, a couple of you kind of mentioned that, that like that audible and that comes in two ways too, I think. I think there's that audible to our spirit to spirit where it's like, go to New York or, you know, the, the, um, just you hear it and you're like, you're looking around, you're like, did anybody else hear that? Remember that first time that, that God spoke to me in regards to Marge and I'm looking around the room and there's that, you want to, you kind of want to ask, did anybody else hear that? But um, they, you don't also want to be the crazy guy in the room. So, um, <laughs> but then there is that outwardly audible, right? Paul, the road to Damascus, where God spoke, Paul saw, but the guys around him heard, right? Paul saw and heard, but everybody else heard too. That I think is incredibly rare. I would not, um, I don't know anybody living that, that has experienced that, where it's that from outside, like you said, Nyleen. It wasn't from outside, but a within, that voice within. Um, another way that God speaks. Hmm? And he uses other people's voices. Yes, I was getting to that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. No, um, the Bible, illumination. That was the other aspect where, like, when God got a hold of me and I cracked open that Bible, all of a sudden the words that I'd read a thousand times, it seemed, all of a sudden they're alive and they're speaking directly to my heart. That's, that's God speaking. That's his voice speaking through written words on a page. And other people, you know, that can be uh, words spoken prophetically. That can be through tongues and interpretation. Um, directly, a lot of times that comes, if it's a direct prophecy, then it's words that are spoken when God gives someone a word just for you. Uh, that happens from time to time. But there's also indirectly, where words spoken in a group setting, you know, it's kind of clear to you that God's speaking directly to you or even... Um, but it's not really the person speaking. It has no idea that what they're saying is God speaking to you. And a lot of times that's in the form of a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge where they're saying things they couldn't possibly know and they still have no idea, but you do. And God's, God's testifying with your spirit. And then sometimes preaching even, um, when a message that's being spoken makes you feel like God's speaking directly to you. Like you feel like the preacher is singling you out. I know I've felt that plenty of times in my life where I'm like, you literally feel like his eyes are locked on you. And you're kind of wondering to yourself, like, did this guy not learn how to like make eye contact with a room? Like, does, does he have to stare? <laughs> but... The reality is, a lot of times, that's, that's all kind of in our head and in our heart. I'm not saying that sometimes there aren't preachers that do that, because I've experienced that too, <laughs> where, where there's preachers that have, they know there's an issue with a certain person, and they literally will lock in on that person and preach to that issue. And that is wrong. That's spiritual abuse, flat out. So I hope there's preachers out there watching this that get that because I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm having fun this morning. I don't know about anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> then there's visions. Nate mentioned that, visions. So there's generally two types of visions. 
okay? There's, there's open visions. That would be like what John experienced in Revelation, where it's kind of that 3D, you're there, you can see yourself, but you're in this hole. Those are rare. They happen. Um, absolutely, they happen. Or there's, um, there's also the closed vision, which is more like um, a sense of seeing it in your mind's eye. You get a picture or a number of different pictures in your mind's eye, and a lot of times it seems those ones are a little bit more mysterious. Um, they take some time to chew on them, to mull on them, to let God unfold them. I've experienced that a couple times where God's just kind of like giving me this thing, and it just unfolds over weeks and months. Um, in that and in the case of dreams, uh, because he speaks through, through dreams as well, uh, what I've found is it's, it's good to write them down. Like if you can, if you're able to get to a piece of pen and paper and write it down, it's hard, especially with dreams, especially now that I got to wear these things to write and read and stuff. Like not only do I have to roll over, find a piece of pen or a pen and a piece of paper, but I got to find my glasses too before I can start writing. It's a mess. Um, but yeah, writing things down, uh, kind of like Malin said too, you got to speak it so you can recall it. That's the same sort of thing. Um, sometimes God speaks to us through words of encouragement of well, as well, where his words, I guess maybe this is more into the, how's, what's the tone in which God speaks to you? How do you hear him? It's odd, but I think it's true that a lot of times, your relationship with your father somewhat dictates or colors how you hear God. It very much can. So if, you, if your father was hard and domineering, God might, you might not want to hear him talk because you think he's going to be hard and domineering. But if your father was, you know, gentle and calm, God's chances are you're going to hear God in that way. So it does color it uh, a little bit, the lens through which we hear and perceive God speaking to us. But just different things that he speaks to us, words of encouragement, words of comfort, words of direction, go to New York. And here's one that we don't like, and, um, but he does. Words of correction. He speaks words of correction prophetically. That's one thing that a lot of times and in, the, in this kind of the personal prophecy movement that's here and there and everywhere, if you're not hearing any words of correction coming out, I'm kind of wondering what's going on. Not that he doesn't, not, you know, it's just, I don't know. There's just something about that. I know that the prophetic words that I've received that were words of correction changed the course of my life every single time. And every happy, flowery word that came to me through personal prophecy, it was nice. It made me feel good in the moment. Kind of like reading your horoscope and finding out that you're going to have a good day but it has no lasting effect. So I'm just kind of like, not to say that he doesn't speak those words and not doesn't speak those things right in the moment, but I think that sometimes we need a word of correction. So now that we've explored these things a little bit and laid out some of the possibilities of how God's voice comes to us, thought we'd take a look at what for many will be a familiar story and see how God spoke to one man. That man's name was Elijah. But before we get to the passage, though, I want to give just a bit of a backstory for anyone out there on live stream or anything that doesn't know the story, just as an, a refresher for those of you that you haven't read it in a long time. It had been a long time since I read through kind of Elijah and his life and I thought he showed up on the scene a little earlier than he did. 
But like chapter 17 of 1 Kings, he's just like, boom, he's just there. And uh, he starts out by proclaiming a drought to King Ahab. He goes to, God tells him to go to this brook and stay there. And, you know, drink from the stream and the ravens are going to feed you. And I'm thinking, ravens, aren't they an unclean animal, but they're bringing him food? You know, I, all sorts of weird things go through my head when I'm reading the Bible. And then after the stream dries up and the ravens stop coming, God tells him to go to this widow who's about to cook her last meal with her last flour and last water for her son. And he goes and he stays with her. And um, she, she cooks him food and the food and the water miraculously don't run out for a long time. And then in that time he's staying with her, her son dies. Elijah raises the kid from the dead. It's incredible. In chapter 18, we find the false prophets, the duel, if you will, on the Mount, I'm going to mispronounce it, Mount Carmel. Did I, I think I got it right. Um, and then, you know, with that, if you're not familiar, Elijah challenges these prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and Carmel, yeah, whatever, on the mountain. And he, uh, they, they do all their stuff. They're trying to, they set up these two altars and they, they sacrifice the bull. And he says, okay, if your God is truly God, if Baal's truly God, let fire come down and consume the, the sacrifice. And then it doesn't happen, doesn't happen. And then Elijah goes into mocking mode, which was funny, I thought. You know, he's like, oh, well, maybe your God's just sleeping. You know, maybe he, he just doesn't want to come down and do this for you. And he, he kind of throws out some more jabs and, and that just makes him get even more upset. So then it's his turn and, he, you know, he sets up this altar with 12 stones and, and he puts the sacrifice, the wood on it and the sacrifice. And then he tells him, go and get some pitchers of water, fill them up, dump them it o- over it dumps it over and he had dug this trough around it and he like saturates everything. How many of you have tried to start a fire with wet wood? Ezra, Ezra raises his hand, I know. I watched him struggle. <laughs> and, uh, but I, you know, it, it, it's soaking wet. And he prays to God and the fire comes down and it consumes not just the sacrifice, but the wood the stones and even the, the water was dried up and everything was turned to powder, it says. That's incredible. Incredible. And then he goes and takes care of the prophets of Baal. So there's the fire, then there's the blood, and then there's the rain where he tells his servant to go up and look. And uh, he, he says seven times, he goes back, do you see a cloud? Do you see a cloud? Do you see a cloud? And then the last time, yeah, one the size of a man's hand is on the horizon. Okay, go tell Ahab, King Ahab, to get in his chariot and go before the rain overtakes him and makes it so he can't go. And then he does this crazy thing. Tucks his robe into his, I don't know how, maybe that's where that whole gird up the loins, you know, I don't know what that... Yeah, the fold through. How did they run in robes? I don't know. But Ahab is going in his chariot and Elijah outruns him. This guy had a miraculous life, a spectacular life as a prophet. Incredible. Incredible. And he gets back and Jezebel says, when she finds out what had happened, If he's not dead by tomorrow, you know, basically, I'm going to kill you. And what does this man of God do that had done all of these things by God's power? He runs. He runs away. So we're going to pick this up in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And uh, we're going to go about halfway down in verse 9. Um. Elijah had ran away. He fled to the wilderness. An angel gave him food, strength enough to walk 40 days into the wilderness. And he went to Mount Sinai and found a cave. And we find him in this cave. It says, there he came to a cave where he spent the night. 
the Lord speaks to Elijah. No. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Ever been in a place in your life where God said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. You know what's interesting about that? In chapter 18, he runs into Obadiah, and Obadiah tells him how he you know, had saved a hundred other prophets of the Lord when Jezebel was trying to kill him. And meanwhile, when he's up there and he's talking to the prophets of Baal, you know what he says? I'm the only prophet of the Lord that's left. I'm a kind of guessing that Obadiah was in the crowd. <laughs> I wonder how that made him feel, you know? But he just, he says, I'm the only one that's left. So then the Lord Response here, he says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. As Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty. The people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. So in this passage, we see that his voice was not where one might expect it. It wasn't in the high energy events like the wind or the earthquake, the firestorm. But it came in the sound of a gentle whisper. Or if you prefer, a still small voice. These three spectacular displays were just the sort of thing that were commonly understood to herald the coming of God's presence in the Bible. On Mount Sinai at the beginning, what happened? There was an, he spoke and the mountain quaked. It shook. There was a cloud. There was a wind. There was fire. Elijah just had the fire. And I might add here, Elijah was somewhat accustomed to spectacular things, don't you think? Like, his was not an ordinary life. But what's interesting here is that none of those things really drew him completely out of the cave. See, he stood up and he saw these things, but he was still actually inside the cave because it says... He came out to the opening cave after he heard the whisper. I mean, he was standing in obedience for sure, but the one thing that he was most accustomed to beyond the spectacular was God's voice. That's what he was really used to. So when God whispered, he heard, he recognized, and he acted in reverence. And he went out of the cave to meet with God. And when God asks him again, Elijah repeats himself in a, from a perspective of self-pity. But God in his voice gives direction with just a little bit of gentle correction. We're going to read 15 on a little ways. And the Lord told him, go back the same way you came. And travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazel to, by, to be king of Aram. And anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be the king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shephat, to from the town of Abel, Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. It wasn't really good news, was it? Like, you're being replaced. <laughs> Ever thought about that? Now you're next. 
Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu. Those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Take that I'm the only one who knows. Put it in your pipe and smoke it. There are 7,000 more than you that haven't bowed the knee. You are not the only one, right? That's a little bit of correction. That's a little bit of changing perspective. But you know, in this, I believe that Elijah with all his flaws still leaves us with a great example from this story. Because let's be honest, it's really easy to get caught up in the buzz and the busyness, the supernatural and the spectacular. The noise and adventure of living a life of faith in step with the Holy Spirit. Isn't it? I mean, it is. It's exciting stuff, and that's okay. Like, it's okay to get excited with those things. But the question I believe that you and I must ask ourselves is are we hearing his voice? Because we can experience all sorts of things, but if we're not hearing his voice, And when he does speak, do we hear him? Do we recognize him? Are we as accustomed to his voice, so accustomed to his voice that we know it's him? We don't have to question it because we know it so well. And here's one. When he speaks, do we act in reverence to him when he speaks? It says that Elisha took his robe and covered his face as he went out to meet him on the outside. Do we act in humble reverence, obedience when he speaks? Go and visit this person. Give this person a call. Do this. Stay where you are. Is there that humble reverence in regards to hearing his voice? And really, are we willing to come out of our own cave, sometimes of self-pity, sometimes of busyness, to meet with him? I can only speak for myself here, but I want to be so tuned into his voice that none of the other stuff draws me at all. I mean, well, getting prophetic words for someone or from someone is awesome. It is. It's awesome. Because it testifies with our spirit that God is alive and moving among us. We should never despise prophecy. His voice spoken to me, to my heart. That's what I crave. That real deal, that direct line that each and every one of you in this room that is a believer in Jesus Christ has. I don't have a speed dial any more than you do. Ah, oh, speed dial. That's old, isn't it? <laughs> it's all speed dial now. I don't even have to remember numbers. But I crave his voice. I crave hearing directly from him. Because really, life is noisy. Right? Isn't life noisy? Has everybody had, I mean, I know some of you had really restful Christmas days. But it's been a busy few days, and the busyness ain't done. Life's noisy, and sometimes, no, a lot of times, it is really hard to find quiet and to find solace and to find retreat from that noise. That's why running off into the wilderness is not necessarily a bad thing, as long as you're not doing it from a perspective of self-pity. And even then, if God can spoke to, speak to Elijah in the cave, he can probably reach you too. That quiet's hard to find. Even here at church on your average day, the sound of traffic by this building is insane. A week or so ago, Ezra and I went out to Italy Valley, um, check out some county land, some 40 acres or something of some of the thickest brush that I've 
ever gone through. And we came out muddy and wet and scratched. It was an adventure for sure. I loved it. But that property was really close to the road. And as much as I was seeking the wilderness, I didn't find it there. But then we drove up to Italy Hill to the top and we got back about a mile off the, off the beaten path. And you hear a plane maybe every 15 minutes, but you don't hear traffic. And it's, it's just quiet. It's peaceful. And I feel like that kind of quiet is what we need to seek, not just externally, but within our hearts so that we can hear God whisper. So what if we were a people who were willing to put down the distractions and tune out the noise that invades our lives? What would that look like? You know, what if we tuned out all the other voices, mine included, (laughs) for a span of time every day? How often when it gets quiet, do you turn on another preacher? How often when it gets quiet, do you turn on some music? How often when it gets quiet, do you find something to fill that void? What if we turned out, turned off and tuned out all of those voices for just a span of time every day, or maybe just once a week even? Just tune it all out. And instead, we dedicated our focus to hearing his voice for ourselves. Sometimes that might mean going into solitude and quiet and nothing else, just silence. It's really uncomfortable. I'll give you a forewarning there if you haven't done it in a while. Sometimes that means bringing your Bible in a notebook, maybe a concordance, If you need to borrow one, I got lots. And I'm going to say something that some people might disagree with. That's okay with me. Leave your electronics out of it. In a different room, shut it off. Don't just silence it, shut it off. Get it away. If you got to take everything off the walls in the room or the space that you're going to, do that. Because when there's not actual physical noise coming... Other distractions will come in from other other avenues. Sometimes you have to quiet the space that you're in to hear him. What sort of people might we become if we were that tuned into his voice? That we heard his whisper even in a crowded room? What kind of church would we become? if the vast majority of us were that tuned into his voice. We might hear so many prophetic words. We might hear him speak through so many different means amongst us that I would have to shorten my sermons. Some of you might think I should do that anyways, or you'd have to stay longer, right? I was going to say, some of you might think I should do that anyways, but you know... (laughs) I believe that we would become a shining light in this community. That's what I believe. That's what would happen. Because what we become is not for us. It's not for us. What we become is to be a witness to the community. (laughs) It happens. I'm okay with that. Phones and crying children, and I don't care. I don't distract that easily. I'm a dad. I believe that this community craves peace. They crave hope. They crave joy and love and kindness. And if we're tuned into his voice, that's exactly what's going to pour through us. That's what's going to pour through us because he's going to speak to us and through us to them. Sometimes he'll use words. Other times it'll be a smile. Other times it won't even be that, but just his spirit radiating from us 
And somebody's like, whoa. And they start the conversation with us. That stuff happens. As we're tuned into his voice and he tells us to go to the one who is hurting, to the one who is alone, to the one who is struggling with addiction, and the one who needs love and ultimately needs Jesus. He will give us direction. He will send us to those people. We will see his voice lead us to the ones he died for and who he will build his church with. And we will see revival spring up one person at a time because the words that he speaks They bring life to dead places in believers and unbelievers alike. His words are life. His words are truth. And even we need personal revival. But it starts one person at a time being tuned in to his voice. John. Danita has got something. All right. Sure thing. And then you can go. So last week, I was hearing from the Lord during one of the songs we were singing and kind of just like, okay, God, is this something that you want to be shared? And I just felt like God was like, hold on to that. And then today he was building it a little more. And so at the end, meet and greet, I'm like, Russ, I need paper. <laughs> because I still felt like he was like, I have a moment for that. And I was like, I need to write this down. I don't know when it's for. Well, all of this has coordinated kind of like the times where people have spoken. And then that Russ is like, you practically preached what I was going to preach type thing. It lines up a lot with this. So <laughs> all of that. Um, So last week we sang Worthy of It All, and um, early on in that song, the lyrics are, all the saints and angels bow before your throne, all the elders cast their crowns before the Lord of God and sing. And as we were singing that, I was just in this place of, God, I want to be found just before you. (laughs) No pause and a breath, but I also, I want to be diligent, God. (laughs) I don't want to just be down there. I want to be doing stuff, doing stuff that's effective. And the Lord just like reminded me of Martha and Mary. So I'm going to read Luke 10, 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the feet at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And so... As this is built, in verse 38, it talks about that she opened her home to him. And it just stood out to me like, okay, this was, this was Martha's invitation. Like, okay, Jesus, please come. Come to my house. It wasn't, as we just talked about Elijah, it wasn't necessarily that Jesus walked up to her door, knocked on it, and she's like, oh my goodness, somebody's here. It was she opened the door to him. And even if it had been that he came up and knocked on the door and surprised her, she still had to have a heart of invitation and acceptance to say, yes, please come in. And so it was an invitation, yet verse 40, she was distracted. How, how many of us, if somebody's over like, oh, I got to make sure that I have, I have snack foods or I have a meal planned or I got to have like this taken care of and, and all these things and the unmade bed that Eileen talked about a while back, like that's us. We, okay, God, 
we, we, want, we want you to use us, but we want this done in us before we're ready for you to use us. We don't want, like, God, this is where I'm at. This is how I am. Just do, do what you want to do and show me what you want to do in the mess, in the state that I'm in. We get distracted. We bog down with all these things. And as this is happening, Jesus didn't walk in like, okay, Martha, I'm here. It's like, these are the things I need from you. This is what you should be doing. It's kind of... He's come, and it's that, that mindset of busybodiness that she's, she's doing all the preparation she's distracted with. And um, she says in verse 40, don't you care? And the tone that Pastor Rush has talked about in Jesus' response, I just point out, Martha, Martha, you are worried. It's not, Martha, get over it. It's not like this calling her out. But it's, it's that he's saying, yes, I care. I see you. I see your concern to be diligent. And, and I love that. But Martha, you're worried. You don't need to be worried. He's not scolding her. And verse 42, he says, she's chosen what is better. <sighs> she has chosen to sit at the Lord's feet. He doesn't say to Martha, you're doing it wrong, and you're doing all these unnecessary things. He's seen the things that she's doing and knows that they're thoughtful. She's trying to set out different preparations to make his visit better. But he says, I don't need that. What's better is to just be with me, to enjoy me. And that brought me back to, as the elders and angels bow before him. The song continues on to, Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. And this is the part that stood out to me last week was, incense is not an unnoticeable thing. If people have incense going on, you know it. It's strong. There's the smoke that goes with it. It's not unnoticeable. It doesn't just happen in the background. Incense stands out when it's being utilized. And I was in that space last week, and I was like, Okay, but s sitting still isn't that, that much of a noticeable thing. Just sitting there to outside people, to people that aren't in our body, they don't recognize sitting at Jesus' feet as a big thing. They just see we're, we're sitting still. That doesn't mean much to them. Um, but it stands out to the people that are being busy and wondering why we're not helping. And I just was like in this spot of like, but how is, that, how is that incense arising that's noticeable? And and I went back to verse 39. Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. In verse 40, Martha pleads, tell her to help me. Had Jesus in that moment said, Mary... This is what I need. I am sure she would have with glee got up and done it promptly because she was there listening and it would have been his request. And all of the things that Martha is doing are not necessarily bad things, but they are not needed in that moment. And she was not waiting on what the Lord was saying to her. And so just how much the better thing is to be in that state of listening in the many ways that we just talked about that, that the Lord and the Spirit speak to us. And God moves us in those many different ways to do things that are often unexpected to us and the people that it affects. It's not something that, like, people see coming. It's something that, like, when it's a word that's spoken by somebody that they don't know that it's speaking directly to you, they couldn't have known. They, they can't direct it to you, but it speaks to you. And they're listening to God to speak it. It is the incense that's noticeable. It is that thing that is, it can't go unnoticed when it's directly spoken to you. And it's something that's unexpected. Or when you feel prompted to go to somebody that is in need and fill that need that Again, you didn't have, you, no one told you that specific need, 
but the Lord and the Spirit prompted you in that movement, and you followed through, and only because you followed through and listened can it be as miraculous and as beautiful and fascinating as it is because God moved it, and it's, it's an incense that can't be ignored. It's that thing that is just arising and bringing glory to him. So that, <laughs> that is my little addition that I've been pricked with. So thank, thank you. you. That was awesome. Oh, it ties right in. You see my heart. Nothing is hidden from you. My pages are open before you. Your ways are high. I'm unable to comprehend. Your thoughts are beyond understanding. Your grace is found in my undoing. It catches me when I fall. Your kindness draws me to repentance. Your blood covers it all.
And God, we thank you. We thank you for this time that we've had with you. We thank you for the season that, that reminds us of what you did before you went to the cross to prepare the way. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your understanding of who we are. And when we lose, we lose sight of the main thing. You don't scold us. You don't, you don't belittle us. You don't, you don't drag us out in front of the crowd to stone us. You just gently come, come back. This is what's important. So God, we thank you for that heart. God, let these words that have been spoken today not leave us unchanged. Let them sink in. Let them take root. Let them bring forth fruit in all of us. And we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next year.